All right, so welcome in today. We're gonna to dive into Voyager. Maybe you guys have been looking at a variety of different exchanges, and one of the things that you probably ask questions on is which one is the best to drop your projects in, all of your tokens, your stable coins, all of that. And we get a ton of questions around where to go, Paul, where to go. Uh, so we thought, hey, let's dive into this today with one of the projects that we've looked at and exchanges that we've looked at um, a couple of times, and that, of course, is Voyager. We're going to dive in deep. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into TechPath. Joining me today is Steve Ehrlich, who is the CEO over at Voyager Digital. Great to have you back on the show, Steve. Uh, thanks for having me, Paul. Appreciate being here today. Yeah, it's been, um, gosh, almost a year since we had a chance to dive <laughs> in and talk with you. So you, And I know a lot has been happening with Voyager, obviously, here recently, big upgrade. Let's go into the first layer of, um, you know, kind of what's happening with Voyager itself. Assuming most of our audience knows who Voyager is, understands probably a Voyager customer, talk to us a little bit about what's happened here recently, especially in light of the new rewards program. Yeah, well, you know, we're excited about our business and how it's been growing, even in a market that's been a little bit quiet volume-wise across the board. Uh, but we've seen a lot of new customers come on board. Uh, we see a lot of customers bringing assets over to us. And I know one of the topics we'll talk about is stable coins and USDC and bringing, bringing cash and USDC over to us to, to earn rewards, which was a lot of the impetus for the Voyager loyalty program and how we're going to you know, expand it and what we announced just recently about the expansion of the program uh, and how to get more people into the ecosystem. Because crypto is all about uh, enabling people, crypto for all, e enabling everybody to access this great new system that's going to be the way we all do business in the next few years. But how to get people into the system uh, who are on the edge and, and are deciding, do I enter crypto, do I not? Uh, you know, we want to give people a reason to to enter the system and get some significant rewards from being in that ecosystem. This is one thing that we talk about here on the show a lot is this transition that is occurring. We're tracking a lot of data from the transition from banks into exchanges, yeah. especially as we see things like debit and credit cards being introduced on these exchanges. In some cases, even bill pay, all things that have a lot of similarities eerily to what banks do. And obviously with uh, the rates of yields that Voyager is paying, uh, you know, I'm a customer, I get a chance to experience your USDC uh, rewards. I keep, you know, uh, a good amount of USDC in there for that very purpose. And yep. I guess the question to you is when you, when you look at the transition of what the market could look like in the next few years, do you see more and more migration coming over from traditional banks or do you think this is just going to be customers and consumers starting to diversify? What are your thoughts? Oh, no, there's no doubt in my mind. I think the, the mission of Voyager is to displace the traditional banks and brokers. And the, and the first way to do it is through USDC and through holding that as a dollar equivalent with no volatility to yeah. you know, get people into the system to understand that Banks themselves, I've been doing, you know, a bunch of investor conferences over the last couple of days, and people ask how you can pay the 9% rewards. It's like, well, why aren't banks paying those 9 They're making that money, and they're keeping it. In our case, yeah. we're giving it back to the consumers. So is this sustainable? Is this a long-term transition? Absolutely. I think people will be using USDC as the form of payment uh, in the future. It's easier. I mean, when you think about it, you go to a bank, you try to do a wire just to Say you want to buy a $25,000 car on a Saturday and you need to wire money to the dealership, uh, you can't do it. And the questions yeah. the bank asks are, are endless, even though they're the ones that had no problem taking in the money, <laughs> but going out yeah. seems to be a problem. Uh, with, with stable coins, you can move your money 24-7, 365. Why wouldn't you be in that, in that system? You know, we have been evolving over the past few years, kind of understanding a lot of our own commerce is done and circled around the crypto environment, especially around USDC and USDT for a, a certain extent, you know, with certain types of uh, international players. I, fi I find right now that mostly when we're dealing with international companies, a lot of times they're using Tether, even though sometimes they'll, they'll jump onto yeah. ERC-20 for USDC. But I'm kind of curious, when you look at um, stable coins in general and the potential for them, obviously the meltdown with UST was a problem. Um, 
the future of it, and obviously the one-to-one -one dollar backing is a big deal with the majors, obviously with a circle and what they're doing with USDC. You look at Gemini, what they've done with GUSD. Do you think this has become kind of the gold standard for all crypto investors now? Are those, are those the kinds of, of stable coins that people are looking to go into? I uh, 100% believe that because I think Jeremy and the team at Circle have done a tremendous job. Uh, they've been open. They've had attestations from Grant Thornton, which is one of the leading public accounting firms, about the reserves that they have. Uh, so I think that, you know, we said when we saw the UST uh, debacle uh, that you know, calling something a stable coin when it's not really backed by something stable isn't really a stable coin. Uh, sure. It's an algorithmic stable coin, but even that word stable coin doesn't, it's not accurate because USDC is backed by dollars and short term treasuries. And you could see the attestation from that public accounting firm. Uh, the others were backed by other coins. And that's more a derivative product in my mind, mm -hmm. rather than it is a stable coin. And yeah. so I think, yes, USDC, you know, is a gold standard now. And they've, they've taken time to get there, but they're uh, they are the gold standard. You know, it's, to me, it's the number one stable coin and the one we like to do business in because we know it's all back and customer assets are safe. Yeah, and I, I think that at least with the legislation that seems to be being proposed, providing, you know, what we see in the final uh, bills that actually go through Congress here in the U.S., that USDC and or stable coins are going to have some sort of regulatory, the safe ones obviously I think will be the one-to-one -one, uh, dollar-backed uh, projects that are out there. So in your particular case with USDC being one of the primary assets that rides on, on Voyager and the fact that you guys are doing some pretty impressive rewards, tiered rewards, but still very impressive yeah. What is the okay? So let's. I, I want to kind of get into the reward side of things. Is there a lot? A lot changed last week. Yeah. Um, in reference to your rewards program. Uh, first question is why did you do the upgrade to the rewards program? What was the impetus to get to get you know even more uh, value into the network? Yeah. Well, the the impetus for that was customers, right? Listening to customers, engaging with our consumers whether we do it uh, as, uh, as some polls, whether we do it as some research and sending uh, uh, information out and getting questionnaires, whether it's meeting one-to-one -one and phone calls and uh, inviting customers out to some get-togethers that we had at, at some of the NASCAR races where we sponsor uh, Landon Castle and you know, getting them together and getting their feedback. It was all driven by customers. Uh, when the first version of the program came out, the feedback was, we need a little bit more. And so we went back to the drawing board and we worked on it and it took a long time for us to do it because we want to make sure we got, you know, version what we call VLP 2.0 correct. And we think it's pretty darn good with more things to come there. Uh, and the core of it really was how do we get more people into the system? How do we change the levels? How do we make the levels attainable for people? Uh, we put three new levels and one really high level, uh, so make that equivalent to, you know, a really selective group uh, of people. But then really at the bottom side, we have a maverick level. Uh, then we have a fourth tier, I think we call pioneer. So you could earn your way up. And the key wasn't about, hey, buy your tokens to up, you know, to improve your level. It's use our platform, make trades, yeah. use our debit card. That's the key to it. Like people can earn their way into new levels. They don't have to buy it. And they just do the activities they were going to do, and they're going to earn their way up. Yeah. So a key here, obviously, uh, looking at going after a ton of new customers, the transition seems to be occurring. Yep. We're seeing more and more. I talk to a lot of people every day, and I just kind of have asked them, you know, how are you guys interacting with Forger? I know many of them, many people who use it. Uh, in many cases, people are starting to, because of the things that we have seen, I won't name exchanges, but there has been some exchanges out there who have been dropping their yields. And Voyager has yep. not been doing that. So I guess my question to you is, how are you doing this? Everybody else seems to be sliding uh, their yields okay. downward, but you guys are either holding or increasing some other sort of value in the rewards program. A few ways on that. One is we put the, we put the customer first, right? When you put the customer first, you're building product that drives uh, customer engagement with the app. Second is we have a vibrant trading business and we put, you know, some of the revenue we earn on that back into the rewards program. 
Uh, third aspect of it is the partners we have. You know, we recently raised $60 million from five of the biggest names in the industry, um, including Alameda Research, including Digital Currency Group, Galaxy, uh, Block Dame, and Three Arrows Capital. Some of the biggest names that are helping us uh, with execution, borrow, lend, and that allows us to do a lot of things to bring value back to consumers. And that's how we do it. We look across all the assets. And remember, we have over 100 assets. Some of them we stake, some of them we lend. And it's all to bring value back to customers to allow them to take advantage of the system. Uh, and right now, we do see a lot of customers coming to take advantage of the rewards. But at the same time, we're starting to see increase in trading because people want to uh, trade more to earn more tokens. So yeah. we're starting to see some more value there as well. And when it comes to trading, I want to get into some of the things. There's a line list of stuff here that that I've been watching here, you know, for my own personal uh, interest, but also for a lot of our audience. What does one X crypto back on trades give you exactly? Because I saw that I'm I was even a little confused as to what the reward is. Yeah, well, the uh, yeah we give price improvement when you give us when you put a market order through our system, not a limit order, but a market order through the system. Over 90% of the time, we're going to give you price improvement on that trade. Very similar to, to the traditional markets that offer price improvement. I was around when the days started when the you know, reg NMS and, and price improvement came into the market in the traditional financial world 20 plus years ago. So we give you price improvement on every trade. 1x means that if we gave you a dollar of price improvement on the trade, you're going to get a dollar worth of VGX at the end of the month as well. Uh, so that's a 1x. If you're in the top tier with us, it's going to be 8x. So if you earned a dollar of price improvement, we're going to give you $8 worth of VGX to keep aggregating VGX. So we take the concept of price, price improvement really seriously. I know uh, Chairman Gensler talked about price improvement in NBB Hill yesterday. I was at that conference. And we think it's a very important aspect in the system that we're the only ones that are given price improvement. Now people can earn even more on executing yeah. trades with us. Well, it incentivizes trading too, obviously, because you're going to look at price improvements, different different layers and tiers are going to give you the VGX token back in. We'll talk to, about VGX as well. Talk about difference in preferred annual percentage and annual percentage boost. Yeah, our goal is to make being part of the program valuable. So over time, uh, we have boosts. So if you're at certain levels, you're going to get a boost. Uh, in VGX, you know, so if yep. you have USDC it, and it reward 9% and you're at the top tier, I think it's like 1.75%, you get that back in VGX on, you know, as well. Those are annual rates, all paid out monthly. Uh, so divide everything okay. by 12 and that's your monthly rate, give or take. Right. Uh, the preferred rates is if you're in the program, you will have a rate that's higher than if you're not in the program. So let's take that uh, and that'll be everything except USDC for the most part. So take Bitcoin might be 3% right now. You're part of our program, maybe it's three or three and a half. If you're not part, it might be two, two and a half. So we're encouraging people to be part of the program. You know, membership has its value. And that's the way we look at this. You know, we want sure. you to be part of the member, you know, membership, hold a hundred tokens. And again, you don't have to pay for them. You refer a few friends, you're gonna get a hundred dollars worth of tokens. And yeah. that's growing the ecosystem within Voyager. Yeah, I, I think you know uh, that in itself. Good reward programs are are kind of the catalyst, I think, of really growing great brands. We've seen it in all sorts of Fortune 500 businesses that have really yep. good engagement side because your engagement lifts. You start to see a lot more activity. The friend referral you're mentioning that really starts to happen uh, quite a bit in something like this. You know, we, we talked a little about some exchanges who have been lowering their yields and in some cases completely deleting them for most part, are you worried at all that there's going to be pressure, whether it's regulatory scenarios, uh, competitive pressures that would cause Borger to have to shift course on how you're dealing with yields right now? We don't believe so. We have a, a very good model uh, that some is lending and some is staking uh, back to the partners that we have. Uh, I can't speak to what other uh, other people do with the assets, but I know what we do and we're lending our assets to some really, really strong balance sheet partners. We don't trade it. I know some of the competitors do trade the assets uh, where they're either buying stocks, they're buying derivatives and they're prop trading customer assets. We won't do that. And we think it's a very simplistic, easy model, easy for consumers to understand uh, what we're doing with their assets. 
and therefore it's it's simple and sustainable and that's the key is sustainable and when when we made the change to the reward program to to put tiers in place we did it with the idea of making sure it's sustainable for the long term uh we feel it really is uh we've got many years i think before anything has to change uh many many years and so we feel very very comfortable uh in the sustainability of, of our program that's good to hear because I've been a little concerned as to how long this party is going to stay around with stable coins, and you know, and with the, you know, the potential of really competitive because the banking system very competitive. Obviously, they're going to get into this space at some point when regulatory, uh, you know, guidelines are in place. So we will start to see, I think, a little bit of a uh, a challenge war in the you know in the exchanges, and of course, there are some scenarios where. Exchanges may get some more regulatory guidance, which could put some pressures on them for, um, you know, things just to stay up to date, which could increase prices and things of that nature on the exchange side. So I am concerned about that. Back to VGX for a second. With all of these actions through loyalty, obviously the lift, the different types of bonuses that you're paying with VGX, do you think this is going to affect the token price from VGX itself, or do you think it's going to kind of hover around this one dollar? Are you trying to create kind of a stable exchange coin here? We, we leave we leave price of the coin up to the consumers and what they feel the value is. We want to bring value to the token, uh, bring value so more people who come into the program brings demand, right? And I think that's what we want. We want people to want the token, be part of the ecosystem, increase demand with less sell always has one, you know, has one effect on, on, on a price. But yeah. we tend to avoid talking about our own price, same way we don't on the stock side of the world. Uh, we let markets do what markets do. Uh, but if we bring enough demand to the token and consumers and build more consumers that want to own the token, you know, you can make your own assumptions. But that's how we look at it. We think there's value, significant value in being in the Voyager loyalty program. Uh, and as more people see that, and, and it's incumbent upon us too. Like we have done a, a, an average job on promoting uh, the value of the Voyager loyalty program. You're going to see it more prominent in our app, more prominent in our marketing about being part of the loyalty program. Similar to what you see with airlines. I get emails yeah. from airlines about being part of their programs all the time. Uh, and so you can make the assumption that not only will we have our debit card, which brings VGX rewards, you know, we'll be into the credit side of the world too. Uh, we want to expand the product horizon, do a better job of promoting our program, and that will bring more demand. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, withdrawal fees, because this is something that we're seeing more and more on the issue in across yeah. across a lot of places. You know, if you even if you look at some scenarios there's even limits on crypto withdrawals on daily limits uh things of that nature i know you you don't necessarily have that on voyager but when you look at uh withdrawal fees even on vgx is what how is that going to lay out overall are you guys going to kind of hold with where you are Are you trying to reduce those what's the plan yeah we're, we're we have a pretty deep blockchain development team uh one of the issues obviously is the gas fees with eth uh, so as maybe it goes to 2.0 and we get that transition, those fees will come down and we'll pass that along to the consumers. Uh, also part of the program, we're allowing people to get discounts off those fees by using VGX to pay. Uh, that's a work in progress. But I think all the time we're trying to reduce the cost to consumers, but there is a cost to run these networks too. And I don't think people should forget that, that in running the networks to allow you know crypto deposits, crypto withdrawals, uh, there are fees and we tend to pass those on uh, with a little bit of, of what we're, you know, paying to, to monitor and work the network and, and, you know, uh, make adjustments to the network all the time, but we're always trying to pass value back to consumers. So, uh, if things change on gas fees, we'll pass that along as well. Yeah. With all of these rewards, the scenario of the incentives to kind of hold VGX as a token, do you feel like this is going to push it into an inflationary, uh, asset? Look, I think the what we see is the increased demand, and we're already starting to see increased demand for people holding the asset. Uh, you know, not only do you get seven percent staking rewards, uh, you know, again paid monthly. Those again, repeating myself, but it's annual rewards because trust me, we get people who who will send service tickets asking, like, I didn't get my seven percent this <laughs> month. It's actually divided yeah. by twelve because uh, yeah. it's it's not a monthly rate; it's an annual rate. 
uh, we're seeing a, a big demand in people trying to move up the tiers right now. Uh, and we haven't even put the program in place yet. So I think the demand is going to continue to increase. Uh, we have a marketing pool that's been well documented that we give uh, the token consumers on. And, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, people say, well, that, that, you know, you, you keep flooding the market with the tokens. It's no, those who are using our platform are getting tokens. So you get to keep your place, just use our platform and you're going to keep aggregating more and more tokens, which is a good thing. Uh, not a bad thing. It, it, yeah. it, it helps us make a sustainable model long-term. Um, okay. So a couple of things that um, this is also asking for myself. <laughs> I have a friend. Yeah. Uh, and when you look at <laughs> Solana and Polkadot, transfers you know i've been looking at moving in and out i want to you know the problem that we have found with vgx is that there's a handful of tokens that are just not movable you know so what is the plan on some of these assets what's the holdback on there are there some technical issues there that with the token or what's the the scenario that plays into that why i can't move dot or in this particular case dot and solana yeah development it's just part of our roadmap to add more and more tokens to uh, the development roadmap of being able to deposit and withdraw. Trust me, I, I, the amount of people that say I want to withdraw, we get twice as many that say they want to bring it in because they want right. to bring it in from somewhere else to, to take advantage of, of the rewards. But um, it's a work in progress. We have a roadmap on all the coins that are going to be added to the deposit withdrawal scenario. Uh, so over this year, you'll see us, I keep, you know, I repeat myself a lot in a lot of the interviews I've done. 2021 for us was all about scaling. We grew so fast, grew so many customers. 2022 is about building product. And the debit card is in, in beta, uh, soon to come out uh, into production, probably within 10 days. Uh, so then we could bring more and more people onto the debit card. We're building more and more uh, protocols that we can do deposits, withdrawals. We have the equity product that's being built uh, for 2022. So a lot more product coming out, plus an enhanced trading. And we don't touch on that a lot, but we're adding more features and functionality to, to bring more trading to the app, to take advantage of the rewards program. All these things are being built in 2022. And, and those Solana and uh, a dot are two of the other ones we want to add. Very good. You know, we're, we're looking, we run a, uh, a program called the Crypto Power Index, and basically we track sentiment, market sentiment, and um, an element we call amplification on a variety of tokens. We haven't put VGX in there, but I think based on what I'm seeing right now, it might be a token that we want to go on because we'll, we'll do three times a week uh, tracking sentiment. We're trying to go to a daily uh, I was looking at your Pioneer, your Navigator, and your Navigator Plus, because this is where you're getting into some really large numbers here. 10,000 VGX on the hold, uh, 25,000 on Navigator, 50,000 on, on Navigator Plus. But the re the rewards here are 6x or 4x, 6x, and 8x on the trade. Uh, and then you've got these boost percentages of one and a quarter, one and a half, and 1.75. Then the crypto back on the debit card. This is another big one. Is this going to be that that would be coming back in VGX tokens? I'm assuming. Is that right? That's correct. All those okay. are coming back in VGX. Yep. So two percent, three, and then three percent on the debit card. Um, when will we see the debit card roll out uh, for Voyager, you know, users today, and for new new people that want to get in there because of a debit card? Yeah, we have, uh, it's coming out of beta over the next 10 days. Uh, we had quite a few thousand people testing it in beta because we're just scaling it and wanted to make sure uh, we did it in the proper manner rather than, okay, we have a 200,000 person waiting list. If we would have unveiled that at one point in time, we probably would have broke. Uh, yeah. So we're coming out of beta over the next 10 days. Uh, what we've seen so far is, is tremendous adoption of it. Uh, consumers using it for all their purchases. Uh, yeah. And not only that, what we see out of that is is consumers and uh, the VGX network all over social posting their card. Thank God our team put their card numbers on the back of the card, not the front. So now it gets used <laughs> as a marketing uh, tool as well. Uh, so you don't yeah. have to worry about posting your picture of your, your debit card because it just has the purple debit card sure. and uh, Voyager on it. And we're seeing that all over social media now, which is which is great. So a couple of, within probably 10 days, we'll start uh, – adding the list of 200,000 to, uh, to allow people to uh, ask, you know, and, and get the debit card. 
Are we going to see, uh, and maybe you can explain on, on your strategy for the roadmap for the card itself. So I'm holding U.S. dollars. Obviously, that's spendable. What about my USDC? Do I have access to it or would I have to sell it off or convert that to USD to do that? That's the interesting thing about our debit card, which sets us apart from, from almost everyone. You're holding USDC. We built the system so that you'll be holding USDC, earning those rewards all the way up into the point of swipe. You don't even have to touch ah. dollars. When, okay. So I have direct deposit. I put some of my paycheck into my debit card and mm -hmm. When that cash comes in, automatically converts to USDC. I can go spend that USDC. Nothing else to do. It's seamless to the consumer. You're holding that USDC 9%. That's exactly how we're building all our other products, whether it's the equities and options trading, whether it's going to be credit products. Everything is going to be built off of USDC. To the beginning of our conversation, we think it's the, the only true stable coin. I know I'll get arguments from some others, but I think it's truly the only true stable coin and we're building our ecosystem off of that so people can earn, consumers can earn rewards. Yeah. Um, UX, this is another knock on Voyager. Uh, it's, you know, it, it, it does the work, it does the job, but there has been some challenges from a UX side of things. Obviously, you guys have done a few things, but is there any planned enhancements around UX, you know, coin token, icons, things like that that kind of help people in the overall trade experience? Man, Paul, you always come prepared with these questions. It's uh, <laughs> it's great. You, you kind of, you, you know, it's almost like you're sitting in our uh, product room. Uh, maybe someone is giving you all that info. That's good. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're we working gotta, on the UI UX. We've got too. our inside insiders over at VJ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, UI UX is key. Uh, I think it's the, it's the key driver for our business right now. The ease yeah. of use of the app is tremendous, but can we make things better and? And as I said, make even VGX and the VLP program more prominent, absolutely. Uh, make some other changes that will be more appealing to consumers. We go through a lot of testing and always working on that. Uh, enhanced our product team quite a bit over the last six months uh, to yeah. focus on the product and, and bring an even better product. I'm curious, you know, there's a handful of strategies out there that are implementing, you know, cards on their exchanges and et cetera. Some are going the direction of credit cards. Some are going the direction of debit card. Why, why go uh, the direction of the debit card versus going maybe credit or both? One of the smartest guys in financial technology and financial services, Chamath, right? I can never pronounce his last name. Uh, from, from social, yeah, 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 yeah. I can never I can never get it uh, get it right. Uh, I would have massacred it. So thank you on that. Uh, listen to podcasts that he, he has done, and, and uh, one that really struck home was that probably the stickiest of all financial services tends to be banking. Uh, and when I speak to people about it, they're like, yeah, I've been with uh, X Bank for 20 years. And so right. the, the bringing of the debit card to the market, we believe, is going to help, help our business and help consumers because we'll become – the place that they want to go and the place they want to, you know, have build their financial lives. And yep. therefore credit products are, are a lot of companies choose credit products because they're just more, more, they make more profit on it. And let's call yep. a spade a spade. Credit products deliver more profit. Debit is stickier. You don't make nearly as much money, but you build a better, deeper customer relationship. And Voyager is about that. How do we build a deep customer relationship to solve problems for the customer? And that's what we're trying to do. That's why we went with the debit card first. Yeah, I think you're, you're exactly right. I know exactly uh, what you're talking about because the key here with banking is getting to scale. If you can start to create a large base of loyal customers, then you can start to layer in the other products like credit products. And in many cases, right. especially when you're talking about early stage customers, maybe just coming out of college, maybe their credit isn't established yet, they have some problems, or even you're dealing with a certain percentage of the population who have challenge credit. So the debit card is an easy uh, gateway into being able to utilize and, and benefit from that and still uh, take advantage of it. So I think that's cool. NFTs, uh, let's talk about that because almost every exchange out there, they've impl implemented a marketplace. They're doing something around NFTs. What's Voyager's plan there? Uh, give or take around June 15th, so less than a week away. Uh, version one will be in beta. Uh, we will allow consumers to view all their NFTs in the Voyager app. Uh, that's the first stage of allowing consumers to 
then transact and buy NFTs from their Voyager app. We have a different philosophy from a lot of the exchanges. We will not build our own uh, marketplace. We think there's enough marketplaces. Pretty much every company under the sun is, is building a marketplace. Uh, from GameStop to Nike, everybody's building marketplaces. But true to the value proposition of Voyager, which is to be agnostic to marketplaces, just find liquidity and access liquidity for consumers, that's what our goal is on NFTs. Not to build this big marketplace, but to allow consumers to access the marketplaces, use us as the on-off ramp, uh, the ability to store and custody the NFTs all on our app and view them. We think that's an extremely valuable proposition uh, that will change the way people look at the world of, the, of NFTs. Yeah. What about going in the direction of DeFi, uh, DeFi wallets? I mean, there's a lot of kind of clunky solutions out there right now. I get frustrated with them on other exchanges. Um, I, I haven't seen a really well done one that's just so fluid. It's got a great UX. It's got great integration. What are your plans with DeFi? Looking at that the same way as looking at the NFTs, uh, we want to bring the NFTs to market first. There's just so much uh, we can do. More than half our staff is tech dev uh, at this point. And there's just so much we can knock off at one point. But we, we have the same view as you do on that, is that we think that you know, accessing DeFi from Voyager is where we'll go. Uh, we're not there yet. And NFTs is our first step on using Voyager as the kind of omnibus wallet that allows you to access those markets. Cool. All right. Let's talk about this because this is something that is happening uh, around, you know, the industry right now. You guys being FDIC insured for the dollar side of it. When you look at um, what has been implemented or proposed in this most recent uh, legislation outline that could roll into it, there's a lot of uh, stipulations for exchanges to say, listen, if you were to go into bankruptcy proceedings, they're going to try, meaning, uh, you know, legislation, to where those bankruptcy proceedings would not necessarily uh, attach to the assets of the user. If that actually goes into place, it's almost like you've got a little bit more security uh, in layers around that beyond what you get with a traditional FDIC insurance. What are your thoughts on how that's going to look to the average consumer, especially in the crypto concern, uh, community, which I feel like most investors right now in crypto, they're definitely smarter than the average consumer, especially when it comes to financial products. How do you think that's going to play out with you guys? Look, I think the aspects of that bill that uh, talk about this and you know, customer assets are important. And I think we're going to get to a place where uh, customer assets will be segregated. And I think that was the lead. And a lot of this topic came up because the SEC in the March quarter said, hey, uh, to public companies, uh, that if you are holding customer assets, you need to put it on your balance sheet so consumers can see Right. what you are actually holding. And that's where this all came about. But at the same time, they allowed, uh, you know, crypto exchanges and brokers and platforms to mark to market uh, those assets where before they were treated differently under accounting standards. So they took the two together. Uh, you know, I think the value of being for us, being a public company and already having done that is consumers see that their assets are there. And our financials are reviewed, they're audited annually. And if we say we have 5.9 billion of customer assets, somebody's actually auditing it. If you're working with a private exchange or platform, you have no idea. And they have no yeah. requirements right now to disclose their balance sheet. In the, yeah. in the true financial securities world, broker dealers every year have to disclose and file their balance sheet. Private, private crypto companies do not. And that's where I think the value proposition in the bill is making everybody abide by those disclosure obligations is extremely important because it levels the playing field. Uh, but at that same time, it makes me wonder why people wouldn't be demanding that from the private companies today. Uh, and, you know, there's only two of us that are public. And we have, I believe we have an advantage on everybody else because we're, we're transparent with consumer assets. Yeah, you've already done it. You know, you've kind of gone through this. But I think you're, to your point is the reason that a lot of consumers and, you know, retail investors is they just don't know that they are missing that key tool 
of understanding how the asset structure is being done within the exchanges that they're operating in. So I would think it really what's happening right now is we're going to see a massive wave of new education, but also at the same time, I think we're going to see a massive wave of new consumers, new retail consumers coming into the space, realizing that legislation is going to soften the blow and, and create some sort of you know safety net, so to speak, for the retail investor in a lot of these different areas. So we, we see it as a, as a potential, even though there are some there's some roadblocks in there, some things I don't necessarily agree with, but I think all of this will work itself out with the right kind of uh, knowledge, both at the legislative level and at the lobby level, which is going to be us and all of us watching this show and participating right now. Yep. A couple of other things when it comes to payment. Um, Gemini and Flexa partnered up. Chipotle just launched a big uh, rollout with their acceptance of payment via the Flexa uh, network, but through the Gemini app and through Speedin. What's the plan or do you have plan on partnerships like that, which would really uh, ramp up retail uh, acceleration on payments? Thoughts there? Yeah, we uh, uh, back in August, we acquired a company called Coinify out of Denmark that does mm -hmm. payment rails for crypto. They've integrated with thousands of merchants already. Uh, we're working with some PSPs as well uh, to do that and to expand that network. But, you know, I, I, I want to be a little bit more uh, cautiously optimistic about payment and people using crypto for payment. Uh, I don't believe that we're there yet. I think it's multiple years away. It's a long tail. We believe it's a long tail on payments for mm -hmm. crypto because people aren't going to spend their Bitcoin today. Uh, they're going to spend it maybe later on, maybe never. Uh, but I think that it's a longer tail where people aren't spending crypto. Uh, they may spend USDC over the rails to do that, but sure. spending other crypto, people are holding it more to earn rewards and to get the price appreciation that they believe is coming. So I think it's just a longer tail. I think it's a really good PR story uh, when some of these major companies are saying, I accept crypto for payment. Uh, the, the numbers, if they disclosed them, would be very small. Yeah, I'm in agreement there. I think USDC will eventually be the base dollar, you know, yep. base money when you think about crypto, if you are looking at crypto exchanges and utilizing it that way. So I would agree with that. Integrating that in, you you guys obviously already integrating it in with the debit card. Do you just see more and more people, you know, companies, whether it's exchanges or other crypto trading platforms, moving to that direction where USDC and a debit card are just kind of the new ubiquitous you know, use case for uh, utilizing crypto as a payment alternative. That's our belief. Our belief is that USDC, and then by having the debit card and using that and paying with USDC, that is the path to eliminate the potential rails and the expensive rails of the traditional system and go to USDC rails only to actually make the payments with merchants. So, you know, merchants today pay you know, 2.9% plus fee right. from, you know, a lot of the PSPs and vendors and, and the, the MasterCards and Visas and discovered Amexes of the world. Now, eventually, the models are going to adapt and change that you don't need those. Uh, they do serve a, a very important purpose when it comes to fraud and a bunch of other things. But eventually, the, the rails might be a lot cheaper for merchants, which winds up going back into the value into the pockets of retail consumers and anyone yeah. who's buying goods and services. So, we think it's USDC on the debit cards, the first pathway to that crypto adoption and using crypto as that real and USDC is the form of payment. Yeah, do, Don't you think, though, that we are going to see less and less fraud with blockchain use case scenarios versus what we've seen in, you know, in traditional finance up to this point? Because it's kind of been fix it while the wheels were turning, you know, in the finance industry over the past few decades. Uh, and we're finally at a point still, but fr fraud is just absolutely rampant right now on credit card and debit card usage. Uh, yeah, I completely agree with that. We could do a whole hour on just the, the fraud in the traditional systems and the ACH system as it's built today. Yeah. Um, you know, it was just, it's a, it's a, it's a, it was a well-constructed system when it was built. It's not the best system in the world now for the way we do e-commerce and blockchain and crypto will change that and is already starting to. Yeah. And so that's why I'm really bullish on this industry because of those changes. But they they don't come as fast as everybody wants. Uh, everything takes time to develop and test to make sure uh, security has to be at a top notch because not only is our technology getting better, but the, 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 the 
the security you need on this is ever increasing because of, of things that happen around the globe. So it's something yeah. that will happen. It's just going to take a little time. Steve, there's, you know, there is a challenge right now with the e-commerce layer of it. I mean, there is only a handful of companies and the ones that do offer services for merchants, for online merchants, to be able to accept crypto. I mean, we run into this on our own network, working with sponsors and partners and even with our own, you know, retail product. It's almost impossible to get a really good uh, payment system that integrates into anything that is in Web2 today. Uh, so there's a barrier that seems to be hitting a wall right now on being able to do it. Because right now when we accept crypto payments, we have to do it manually. It's a very you know, clunky model, but it's very safe and it's very secure. And I've yet to have any kind of issues with it, but it still is very clunky. Do you think there's a potential path for you as Voyager to get into something like that, you know, like a BitPay kind of concept of being able to plug in and you know a small applet on a website and be able to go right into my Voyager account from uh, either a retail or a B two B transaction. Any kind of future uh, around that for e commerce? Yeah, that's our Coinify product, and I'm, now I'm going to have to make the sales pitch. I'm going to have to get my Coinify <laughs> guys to uh, sales to, to give you a call. Uh, but yeah, that's exactly what the Coinify business does as well. Uh, we've made it pretty simple for merchants to actually accept crypto. Uh, there are some out there that are, are clunky. Uh, I've done some stuff uh, on different places, just playing around and testing. I'm constantly doing that. I probably have every one of my competitors' apps, so now they're all going to go back and see what my account is with them. Uh, but I'm always looking to see what uh, what the competition is doing, and it's the same thing on the payment side. And so Coinify has built a pretty good product uh that does, you know, to the company you mentioned, uh, similar, but, but what we hope and think is a little bit more streamlined. Yeah, I got to check it out then for sure. All right, last, uh, last couple of questions here and then we'll, we'll get, get going. Um, and this is a tough one because last bull run, Voyager, and I experienced this, there was a little bit of an issue with the network itself during some very right. high volatile transactions with Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, Voyager became unavailable. And the, the issue yep. is a lot of people push back on that. There was a lot of uh, talk within the social sphere. You know, the YouTubers and, and the networks out there were talking about it. We're going to run into this again. Um, I mean, we're going to get another bull market and we're definitely going to get a lot, a lot more volatility with new, new traders and all that in the market. How are you guys addressing that issue in the future? Yeah, 2021, you know, being honest and you're spot on on that is that we had issues. Uh, we scaled our system to at least 10 X right now. Uh, we had a system that was built that needed to be dissected and a lot of cases rebuilt. Why some of the products we wanted to bring to the market have been delayed. Uh, what we tend to say is we had a monolith system and we had to build it and dissect it and put it into microservice system. Uh, yeah. But that's what startups do. That's when, when you get started, you, you build fast and then you find where you have to sure. expand and change. So yeah. our system could go about 10 X, maybe even more at this point in time. Uh, so we're, re- we're, we're, we're eagerly awaiting this next bull run because we know we're going to, how we're going to perform because we've tested it and scaled it and we're ready to go. Good to hear. All right. Um, last thing for you, and that is uh, when we look at the landscape right now, Terra and UST, that was a problem. Uh, even though I think the market fared fairly well with such a meltdown of a major top 10 token, do you see other you know, projects out there that are doomed to see these kinds of destinies uh, out there? Or do you think we, oh. what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, look, I think your first point, that the, the market itself absorbed that loss yeah. uh, and that issue Pretty well. extremely well. Yeah, really well. And and even some of, uh, and that's a lot of my comment to people and they're like, well, you know, uh, there's X company lost X millions of dollars. In a lot of cases, they didn't lose physical dollars. They lost what they had earned paper wise. So there's a big right. difference. They didn't lose their capital. Uh, and so we absorbed that really well. Are there others out there? I surely hope not. Uh, but what I recommend, you know, uh, and whatever I say, I don't, you know, it, it's, is not something that I would, you know, I put a coin or this coin or project in jeopardy. I just, you know, uh, think that all consumers should do their research, look at the coins that they're investing in, uh, make sure they understand it, 
Uh, but I will say when you think about stable coins, back to where we, we, we started earlier, was not all stable coins are created equal. Look at, the, look at what's really backing those coins and make your decision. But do the research on, on crypto like you would do research on the equity market. So make your decisions, yeah. make smart decisions. Uh, and it's always a good thing when you make investments, you know, the recurring part of it where you're, you're uh, uh, adding a little bit each month and you're having dollar cut DCA is, is a really smart way to invest too. Yeah, I think that's a, a good point. You know, we talk about it here on the channel a lot is, is the research and the education that has to occur in this marketplace right now is massive because most, most new retail investors, and to a certain extent, even some of the uh, structured capital investors, I've talked to private offices who are still a little bit blind on what's happening here. And yep. even at that case, to your point, is really understanding. Because I, I talk to people all the time and they're like, well, I, you know, I'll ask them about you know, five or six different stocks. They've done the research on those stocks and they've done the research on those securities. Why would you not go into it? And the question I always get back or the answer I always get back is it feels so complicated to understand what these tokens do. And this is something that I've talked to many projects about. You've got to dumb down the delivery and get to either a utility or some sort of case that a, a user, a regular retail user can understand because that's the key. If you get into these, as we call them, gobbledygook type uh, blockchain projects that nobody really understands what it does, those are the ones that I feel like are going to really struggle in the future, especially in this next layer of adoption, because we're getting ready to see a whole new phase of adoption in both boomers, Gen X, and even to, uh, some of the older millennials that have not entered into crypto in, in the past. And it's going to be very important to get that message out. Completely agree. Education is super important. I think the Last bull run, and I said this at, uh, at the SALT conference in the Bahamas about a month ago, I was on a panel and it got people looking at me with this stunned, uh, I can't believe he said that, is that we can't sell this, this cryptocurrency on FOMO. Uh, we can't sell yeah. the adoption on FOMO. That's the wrong way and that's not sustainable. We have to sell it based on the value proposition that blockchain and these projects are bringing to the world's economy. And sure. if we if we all believe we're going to sell on FOMO, leave whoever, whoever's selling it on FOMO. I would never put my money there. You want to yeah. you want to put your money and invest in companies and that are supporting projects and helping you bring education because that's the value prop here. You know that's how we did it in two thousand two thousand one when I was at E Trade. You know what what did Oracle do? What did what did Cisco do? Like you had to educate people on how that was going to change the internet. FOMO is the worst way you can sell. We, we, we all grew businesses on FOMO, but now it's trying to make this sustainable and we have to change the way we sell and educate consumers in this business. Steve Ehrlich, always great having you on. Thank you so much. We're gonna be watching Voyager very closely. I think, you know, after this interview, I've got to, we've got to add VGX to our power index so we can start tracking the sentiment volatility on that token. I'm gonna, it's getting interesting for sure. So thanks again for stopping in today. We appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me again. Excellent. All right, you guys are tuned in over on the podcast right now. Wow, these are the kind of interviews that you guys are missing out right here on YouTube. You get a chance to check out a lot of our CEO interviews and also some of our deep dives on tokens, how we break down the whole utility aspect of a lot of projects because it's one of the big things that we try to bring to you when we do project analysis. But this is the places where you're going to get it and that's right here on YouTube. Make sure, and of course, subscribe to the Diamond Circle. It's a private member group. You get a couple of emails. We do a lot of cool things that deliver insights and innovations around what's happening in crypto. If you want to reach me, it's out on Twitter, at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechBath.